All right, 15th Amendment is the final thing that comes out under the Grant Administration for of, among your amendments. Okay, 13th, abolish slavery. 14th, define citizenship. 15th says the right to vote shall not be denied based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude, which might be a previous slave or something like that. And so Grant is now President of the United States, and he's there pretty much thinking the South now knows we're very serious about this. Okay, Reconstruction governments in the South now go forward based on those five military districts. This is a couple of IDs for you. Scalawags and carpetbaggers. The South is irritated. The South has got a choice. It can either fight these federal troops coming in. Can it fight the federal troops? Should it do it? Probably not. What's their, okay, should they participate? Should they go along with what they're doing? Here's what the Southern dominant white group does. They decide to boycott the elections. They will not participate in these new governments. They're going to bide their time. But some Southern whites do get involved in these governments and they do stand for office and they are known as scalawags. Yo, scalawag, right? You traitor. Scalawags are Southern whites who stand for office. East Tennessee would be full of scalawags. This is an opportunity for the non property class who weren't under the tradition of planner leadership. They weren't deferential to planners. They were independent-minded Southern whites who didn't like the planners. They went ahead and stood for office. But the planner class wants, wants to call them scalawags. You are working with the people who are invading us. Um, the other ones are carpetbaggers. Carpetbags, the first luggage in America was to take old carpets and cut them up and sew them in such a way that you have a bag. And so carpetbaggers would be uh, people who've arrived by with, a with suitcases. Now, so I'm talking about the makeup of the southern governments that, that get elected and in place with military reconstruction. Who comes out to vote? Well, so that some southern whites come out to vote. I've told you who they are. But some northerners come to the South, and they hold office, and they stand for office. Now, Southern whites end up calling them carpetbaggers. You guys are Northerners who come down here and taken advantage of our difficulty. You're only in power because you support this invading force, and you're only down here to make money. This is like this gigantic carpetbag, right? You're only here for loot, to loot the South. And our poor good government, Lady Columbia, is struggling under your Reconstruction government. Now this is the interpretation of the dominant Southern white redeemers after they managed to end this thing. And I will tell you this, the South, also the third group that participates in these Southern Republican governments are blacks who come out to hold office. Free blacks from places like South Carolina, um, uh, b businessmen who were African American and who lived within a, an apartheid world but weren't slaves, they hold office. We have one governor from South Carolina and we have nine uh, congressmen who get sent to Washington. So we have Southern blacks, not a large number, uh, holding office, uh, scalawags, Southern whites, and then carpetbaggers, interlopers as they would call them. They form these governments. Those governments are only in power because military is there from the north. That's the Reconstruction governments. All right. Now, um, the whiskey ring. There's a lot of corruption in American state, city, and federal government in the 19th century. People enter office or politics to make money on the political process, on the, on the spending of money. And under Grant's administration, some of his key people get accused of corruption. The whiskey ring is a group of people who were involved in the collection of whiskey taxes. A group gets together of conspirators and they say, hey, there's a lot of money coming in here. That's a lot of money. Oh, that's, we're only getting you know, $3,000 a year for a salary. Let's all take some of this, right? And so they get people back in Washington on the payroll too, and they've got to cook the books, but enough of them get in a ring, right? Like a gang. They get together and they are like siphoning off. I mean, it worked once, let's do it again. They're like taking all this money now, uh, Congress has to go after them, and liberal Republicans don't like this from New England, and Grant, they, they think Grant's looking the other way, and it undermines Grant's administration. I'll just say that. Now, Mississippi had an occupation. Mississippi whites, most of them, don't participate in this new formation of government. 
But a government is formed, and they have a governor, and they have a congress, and they've got mayors, and they are scalawags, carpetbaggers, or African Americans. Okay, there's their government. One year goes by, two years goes by. Now the question is, how long do the federal troops stay? And they say, I think that government's good. We'll leave. And so they pull the troops out of Mississippi. And then we have the Mississippi plan. The Mississippi plan is now the old whites come back and start challenging those Republican governments. Oh, by the way, every one of those new governments in the South, guess what party they are? They're all Republicans, right? They're not Democrats. Democrats weren't voting. So now majority white men come out who don't like blacks, and they don't like the Republican Party, and now they challenge, but they do more than that. The Mississippi plan is about coming back and challenging, but also assassinations, intimidation, and they start attacking uh, blacks who want to hold office. They attack blacks who want to come out and vote. They assassinate leaders, and they, majority, they also are the majority of the people who are, by the way, the redeemers are these old southern planters who say now it's time to come back and overthrow those Republican governments and restore the rightful democratic leadership of Mississippi. What's the choice now? You send the federal troops back in because of the assassinations and such? Now the North's got an interesting question to ask themselves. How long do we stay in the South? It was anger at Johnson. Johnson's gone. So now what happens is the interest of the North begins to wane. And guess what they decide to do? Faithfully, they, faithfully, they decide not to send troops back in. And Mississippi is no longer a Republican government, but now it's a Democratic government. They've got a new governor. They've got assassinations going on. They've got new elections. And the, and the North, so that's a green light to the other states. So the Mississippi plan goes from state to state as federal troops are pulled out. And those moderate Republicans from Indiana and Ohio and Wisconsin and Illinois, they're like, oh, let's just, the South's going to be the South, right? We'll just leave it alone and we'll go forward. We're going west. We got the western territories opening up. We got industrialization taking on. Maybe we'll just let the South be the South. So now, with these Reconstruction governments being overthrown and the Democratic Party coming back in, you've now got Jim Crow comes in. You know what Jim Crow is? All these restrictions on African Americans in the South. Now that the Democratic Party is coming back in, they want to strip the rights of African Americans as much as possible. They make it so they can't vote. This is the, um, these are just depictions of the time about anger towards African Americans. The end of Reconstruction. Grant has two terms. It's 1876 election. This is your ID, uh, Tilden or Blood. Tilden is the governor from New York who runs for president as a Democrat. Governor of New York running for president. He's counting on the vote of these reconstructed, well not reconstructed, redeemed states. Mississippi uh, had voted for Grant in 1872 because it was still under occupation. But, they're, but now that that's Democratic Party again, they're going to vote for this northern guy from New York now. The Democratic Party is starting to come together back as a national party now. And Mississippi's, uh, Alabama's been redeemed, and Georgia, and he's up against Hayes, Rutherford B. Hayes. Rutherford B. Hayes was a man from Indiana who was a Republican, uh, who was a northern general, and he's running. The election comes down, and look at these numbers. It looks like Tilden won by about 200,000 votes. That's a tight election, right? But what ends up happening is that there are three states in question. South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana still have federal troops in there, and they don't have independent governments yet. And what ends up happening is these states send their results to Washington, their electors, and they say, Republicans won down here. The Democrats say there's no way Republicans won down there. There's not enough of them. They're mostly Democrats down there. And so it's going to go to the House of Representatives. And that's where the Compromise of 1877 takes place. Hayes wants to be president. It's going to the House of Representatives. It's going to be a vote there. He wants some Southern Democrats to not vote for Tilden, but to allow his election to go forward, to certify his election. And he says, and I will do something for you. I will end Reconstruction. I'll do three things. I will remove the remaining troops out of the South. I will send money to the South for rebuilding the South, 
federal funds are coming your way. Some of that money, as it gets down there, may fall out of those wagons, and I won't worry about it. And then number three, I will appoint a southerner to my cabinet. And they say, enough of them say deal, we'll do it. It's, it's not publicized. It's a surprise. But Tilden or War, by the way, or Tilden or Blood, is this period of about three months where the country doesn't have an election result. And Democrats feel like the election are being stolen from them. And they're really angry. And they're saying, if President, if Governor Tilden does not become President of the United States, it's going to be blood. It's going to be civil upheaval. That's what that's about. So it's a tense time for us when this election party politics are coming back on a strong way in America. But the fact that House Representatives go ahead and confirm Hayes, and Hayes becomes the next president. There is no president until there is a president Hayes. And Hayes fulfills his promise. He pulls the troops out of the South. That's why Reconstruction has come to an end. And he sends money to the South, and he appoints a uh, man from Tennessee as the Postmaster General. <laughs> That's his cabinet position. Not a big cabinet position, but it's a cabinet position. And so in history, we say that's the end of Reconstruction. That's the end of that whole period between 1850 and 18, almost 30-year period of national crisis over this issue of slavery and union and authority and the place of African Americans in this new country. Now, the 14th Amendment, boy, if they didn't get the 14th Amendment, there'd be, who knows where we'd be today. We would not be a multicultural society. It might be the only Anglos who are citizens, right? And all other races aren't citizens. So the 14th Amendment got done there, but it's not going to be for 100 years later to the 1950s that the federal government is going to come to the aid of federal, well, American citizens who live in the South under the Jim Crow system and try to help them. Because the 1877 compromise is Northerners saying, you know what, the South's going to be the South, and then the Southern blacks are going to be mistreated, disenfranchised, abused, impoverished, and it's not our problem. And it's better than them. A, we don't want to go back to war with the South. And B, we don't really want these people moving up here. Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson is when the Supreme Court receives a challenge. A Southern black family. They try to challenge a state law saying that their kids can't go to a school with white children. It goes 1897. This goes to the Federal Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says... That state law, which says that you've got to have separate white and black institutions, is constitutional. It's not against the 14th Amendment if it's equal. If there's a the white school and the black, it, it doesn't define equality, right? I don't know if it says you've got to have a door and a roof, and that's, you know, and that's our measurement. But here's what I want you to know. Plessy versus Ferguson is a green light for all the other states to go forward with their Jim Crow laws because the federal courts are not going to bring the government back into some conflict over the plight of African Americans and their equality in America. The final one is the Atlanta Compromise. Booker T. Washington facing the question of what are African Americans do in response to the fact that they've been disenfranchised, they're impoverished, they do not have any rights, what are we to do? And he famously, he's a well-educated black southern man who comes out and makes a speech in Atlanta, and he says, you know what we're going to do? We can't control the fact that they hate us. They hate us because they fear us. What we've got to do is make ourselves out to be model citizens. We just need, oh, fine, we won't vote, and we won't conduct government, but we will just simply, we'll educate ourselves, and we'll live good lives, and finally, whites will stop fearing us, they'll stop hating us, and they'll allow us equality. Now, whites just go nuts. I mean, they're crying in the crowd. Like, thank you, thank you. Here's a sensible black man who's telling blacks in the South to just deal with it, right? Later on, they're like, well, you're an Uncle Tom. You're, you're simply telling the blacks to accept this exploitation, whereas we should have risen up. Can you imagine? I mean, that's their option, right? Could the blacks rise up in anger and, and fight for their rights? What's that going to look like? Is that going to go well without the support of white troops coming down to help them? It's going to be a bloodbath. So I forgive Booker T. Washington for advising, because you don't have very many options, you might make the best of the situation. Later on, 1950s and 60s, you're thinking, oh, he just sold them out. I don't think there was much of a choice. 